Tell us a bit about what you do as a strategist. Well, um, a lot of my work is involved in um, advising um, healthcare leaders, government ministers on their cybersecurity strategies um, and helping them to put in place the types of uh, controls that they need in order to protect their business and ensure the safety of their patients. And you work across the globe? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Where are you based? I'm based in Colorado, but um, I but spend most British. of... I'm British. Okay. Uh, I've lived in America for the last 20 years, or 20, 20 plus years, uh, but uh, I think overall I've lived in over 30 countries. So, so we reverse places. I'm American. So, right. I've lived in London for over 30 years. So we've changed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, so share with us the key learnings from uh, recently, the last uh, about a year ago, is a year mm -hmm. and a half ago. There right. was a cybersecurity attack in Singapore. We're in Singapore now. Right. Um, you know, what, what do you think the key learnings were from that? Well, let me let me start by saying that the Sing Health breach was a very um, sophisticated attack executed by a very capable um, adversary, most likely a, a, a rogue nation state, um, and it would have been difficult for most health systems um, anywhere in the world to have uh, prevented um, or thwarted that attack. And um, that being said, I think um, that. The, the Singh Health Breach is a wake-up call for uh, government leaders and healthcare leaders right the way across the ASEAN region um, that their health systems um, are potentially vulnerable, right? Do you think that governments um, think of security as a given and when it happens they're surprised when they're asked for money, it always seems that there's a different thing they want to use the money for. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes down to communication of risks, right? We don't really, in healthcare, have a good understanding of the level of risks of every aspect of the hospital system or a treatment system, right? That includes, you know, an identification of all of the assets that are connected to our networks, right? We talk um, mostly about the IT systems, the servers, the workstations uh, that are used by clinicians um, in order to diagnose and treat patients. We're not really looking at the bigger picture of all of the IoT assets, which are increasingly being connected to our networks, um, not just the CT scanners and X-ray scanners, uh, but the proliferation of medical devices, um, uh, network-connected pumps and uh, telemetry systems, right? robotic uh, surgery appliances, uh, pharmacy robots. These are all connected, by and large, to the network um, and are relatively unsecured. They outnumber the number of traditional IT assets on our networks now. And this is a major risk that has failed to be addressed by all but the, the top hospital systems in the world. So it's a huge ecostructure. It is. Um, there's, it's almost ubiquitous. Indeed. Right? So yeah. therefore, protecting it is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. So we should, as in governments, hospitals, healthcare mm -hmm. providers, spend a lot of focus and time, and possibly financing, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we're safe. Indeed. We need to spend a lot more money on security, and I'm not saying it just because you know I'm a security practitioner and I live and breathe security every day, but I think what we need to do is to match the types of funds that are made available to protect um, our uh, health information assets and, and to protect the safety of patients, which is the, the new frontier right, um, in cybersecurity and healthcare. Uh, we need to protect them from uh, attack based upon an understanding of the assets and the risks. Most healthcare organizations perform controls based risk analysis of their IT assets. They don't perform an asset-based risk analysis as NIST 800-30 would stipulate, right, um, to identify all of the uh, potential areas that could be attacked within the so network. So this new dimension, uh, patient safety, can you mm -hmm. talk a bit more about what does that mean, patient safety? I know what it means in terms of healthcare and right. medicines. And so if you, if you were to ask the CEO or the CIO of a, of a hospital system what their number one risk was, they would probably tell you patient safety. By that they mean, you know, um, hospital-borne infections or someone slipping on a wet floor or a, 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 a surgical procedure that went wrong, right? <clears throat> a negative outcome. Um, they would not necessarily think beyond that to the cyber aspects. Now when we talk about cybersecurity and healthcare, we're talking about three things. CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of health IT systems, right? Um, 
most of the breaches that um, have been reported or that have made the press over the last you know, 10 years have all been about breaches of confidentiality. My PHI, my personal health information, or my PII, my pe personally identifiable information was breached, or the IP of my research hospital was stolen, right? We, uh, we tend, it tends to make the headlines. Um, it it uh, tends to invoke um, a response from the population to say, hang on, can I trust my hospital with, with my data? And we've seen some pushback in certain countries like Australia around the, uh, the My Health record there from people exempting themselves from that electronic uh, record. So just um, on Australia, I think they've recently closed the exemption period. Right. And I think they've gotten over 90, 92% acceptance, so very low rejection, it, it was great. Yes. Uh, there was a great concern there for yes. quite a number of months, as you're probably that. aware. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> a lot of people you know, asking questions about you know, how secure is my data. Exactly, right? exactly. So that's the confidentiality aspect. Um, the new frontiers are really around the integrity and the availability. The integrity of my uh, my health record, is it correct, right? Um, if I go into hospital for elective surgery tomorrow, right, um, I, my, I have an interview with the, the doctor or the nurse um, the night before my surgery. Um, they, uh, they check through my allergies, my medical record. Uh, they may cross-match my blood type, um, and they enter that into an, my electronic medical record. If during the night the hospital medical records are hacked, mm. my blood type is ordered, <coughs> altered, um, my um, allergies are removed, right? It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, right? Yeah. I could end up with uh, post-operative complications, right? Or, As worse. A, or worse, right? Mm. Um, the same is true of availability, and we saw that in the um, ransomware attacks um, a couple of years ago that impacted a large part of the British NHS, right? Where hospitals had to be put in ambulances and shipped, you know, many miles to, to other hospitals that weren't impacted. If the availability of the health IT systems um, is compromised and we can't use those systems to diagnose and treat patients, um, it's very difficult in today's level of digitalization to revert to paper, to go back to the way that physicians treated patients back in the 1960s, for example. Meanwhile, people are still getting sick, they still need health care, but they can't be serviced because Exactly, exactly. Right. So talk a bit about, uh, imagine me, I'm a CEO of a hospital group, mm -hmm. or a hospital, a hospital group, or a minister, mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm looking at my cybersecurity issues, my security, my budgets, my finance. Mm -hmm. uh, how much would you recommend I think about for allocation of money into cybersecurity and, and protection? Well, the first thing there is it, the money uh, or the budget should match the level of risk, right? Um, we need a risk assessment. We need a risk assessment first and foremost to understand the level and complexity of the risk, mm -hmm. right? And then the response needs to be holistic and comprehensive, right? You can't spend all of your money um, building the world's most impregnable front door without spending some money on window locks, right? Mm -hmm. To stop perpetrators from coming in the back door or through the windows, right? So we need to. Uh, we need to um, allocate funds based upon the level of risk, right? And, and I'm not seeing that uh, currently. I'm seeing oh, okay. budgets in healthcare around the you know five to ten percent of IT overall spend. Seems like a lot of money. Is ten percent a lot of money? It's healthcare? it's very small if small. you compare it with other industries, right? Okay, Obviously. What, what would they do well, so comparison? let's take financial services for example, yeah, right? Um, the financial services have a lot to protect. It's mm. very apparent very immediately when a bank gets hacked. Right, and large amounts of money get stolen, or some type of fraud takes place there. They spend closer to 20% of their IT budget on security. Right, um, if I'm the CISO of a uh, hospital system in Singapore, for example, I've got a handful of of uh, individuals on my team that are probably mostly focused on operational functions. Right, getting users the right permissions they need to use whatever system that they happen to be, you know, assigned to. Um, it's not. Um, <clears throat> it's not a, a big comprehensive team. I don't have a 24 by 7 SOC to understand a security operations center to understand what's happening from an incident response perspective on my network. Um, whereas if I'm the CISO of a, a large bank, I have a team of 100 or 200 people, right? Wow. I have a, a SOC that's manned 24 by 7 by top of the line experts, mm -hmm. right? And I have you know, 20 or 30 people in there with various levels of investigators and analysts that can quickly identify
identify a potential indicator of compromise on my network so that I can inoculate that infection, uh, to put it in medical terms, yeah. and I can contain it uh, with, before it does any damage to, uh, to my critical systems or to patients. So more people in the bank <laughs> protecting the money mm -hmm. versus fewer people in the hospitals protecting the people. Pati patients' lives. It just shows you the prioritization that yeah. we have as, as a society between the protection of our assets versus the protection of our people. Right. So hopefully that message will get out there. Um, uh, in terms of what I can do as a CSOC or a CIO in a hospital hospital group, mm -hmm. what would the recommendations be? Um, I don't have a big budget. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have many people, as you said. Right. I'm working very hard and working in the IT. What should I do? What would be the two or three things you recommend I focus on? So the first thing is really there is a shortage globally of cybersecurity professionals. By that I mean people that are either certified, qualified, um, or experienced um, in aspects of cybersecurity. And it's a broad range of, of skills from identity management right the way through to operations and incident response, right? Uh, forensic investigations, for example. Um, is there a qualification? I'm not even there are, there are a number of no qualifications. qualifications. Um, there are a number of academic qualifications. We're seeing now um, in various universities degrees, undergraduate and graduate degrees in cybersecurity, which is a, a, a huge um, uh, step forward, leap forward. We're also seeing a lot of people now getting professional certifications like CISSP, the CISM, um, and other, other certs in that particular space from other um, certification authorities that are helpful as an indicator that someone has basic security knowledge. It's a bit of a catch-22 for some of these because you need experience before you're fully certified, yeah. right? Um, but I think it's a move in the right direction, right. and for people that are entering the profession, it's certainly something that you know they should they should consider. Right. So we have a resource, a major resource shortage um, in cybersecurity. There's about a 12 to 16 to one uh, ratio between wow. uh, job openings and candidates suitable to fill those positions, right? So anyone that is looking is in high school or you know, starting their undergraduate degree and wondering where they want to go, uh, where there's going to be jobs for them. Uh, I can tell you with certainty that there's going to be lots of jobs in cybersecurity for the next 50 years oh, at least. Great to know. Great to tell our audience. Um, uh, absolutely. I'm a CIO. I have 500 beds mm -hmm. and my servers are in the office behind us right here. Mm -hmm. What should I do? I would suggest you look at um, migrating your data center to the cloud, right? Healthcare has been very conservative in terms of adoption of new technologies, particularly cloud-based technologies, but I think it allows you to uh, save significant sums of money in certain aspects. There needs to be an optimization of what you put in the cloud versus what you keep on site. But it allows you to migrate to new apps, new server systems, um, virtualized infrastructure, um, and to gain the benefits of a cloud service provider that is staffed with um, deep, deep expertise around cybersecurity and system availability and operations and infrastructure. Which you can do as a CIO of a small you, sir, you, you could never afford to do never that, right? You could never that. attract and retain the right sort of people to build that out um, on the budget that you have available. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, tough question. Mm -hmm. You have a magic wand. When you're in Hims TV, you're talking to the world. Mm -hmm. What would you tell the world would be the one thing you'd want to change to improve healthcare outcomes? Um, I would I would suggest that we have an issue with healthcare costs. You know, this has been the focus of a lot of the conference here. It's about integration of new technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning. I've heard a lot of the speakers talk about some really great mm. ideas and mm. some great programs that they've they've implemented here. It's been very educational, even for, even for me. Um, I would suggest that we have a problem around um, availability. These technologies, um, these solutions uh, for advanced cancer screening and uh, and all kinds of other things that we've heard um, are are available at, but at a cost uh, and I think we're because of the rising costs of, of healthcare we're in a bit of a, uh, a bit of a dilemma right um, is this accessible to the global population uh, or these new technologies are they available to the global population probably not right so if costs could be lowered that would help distribution and penetration so you'd be able to get those uh, alternatives out to more people around the world uh, absolutely help more people yes and then the volume would compensate for possibly lowering your price correct correct and you know 
by lowering, uh, by lowering prices or containing costs, and we can do that not just by reducing what we charge patients, but by more effective and more efficient delivery mechanisms, right? Um, by uh, the use of extensive use of telehealth and telemedicine, exactly. right? Uh, we heard one of the speakers uh, talk about the fact that they can see four patients via telehealth for every hour that they spend with a patient, right? Um, so there are some efficiency gains to be had there. Um, I think that um, the healthcare industry as a whole needs to now look at how can we drive efficiency while in improving patient care.